Well, good morning, everyone. And I'm Richard Deckelbaum from Columbia University, and I'm pleased to be uh, moderating this session on innovative methods and metrics for nutrition research and programming. I'm actually speaking from Northern Iceland, and uh, I'm gonna listen to part of the meeting on my recordings, but uh, I've been part of an advisor and advisory committee of Nutrition Innovation Laboratory since its embryonic stages. And I insisted that I take this little break in this beautiful country to be with you because I, I must admit that when I've looked at different projects, different parts of the world, this is by far one of the most successful, innovative and uh, programs that I've seen that's taken a bit of seed money, I mean, seed funding, and been able to build multinational or multi-sectoral projects in many different countries. And one of the challenges that uh, was present right from the beginning is how do you take the data from all these different agriculture, nutrition, other economic sectors, how do you bring them together? And how do you get people to understand that uh, you need some way of analyzing this multiplicity of data sets uh, where they're really linked to each other. And today, uh, I think we're fortunate, we're gonna see three different examples uh, of how uh, sort of methodologies have been developed specifically for this program and how they've been integrated to not only produce pa published papers, research papers, but also to train people and to change policy. So I, I think it's, I've been privileged to be part of this over the years. And uh, we're going to have three speakers uh, who are going to be giving some summaries. They can't cover everything that's been done, but uh, I think we're, we're pleased today that we have uh, Giacomo Zanelli, uh, from University of uh, Reading in the UK. Uh, we'll have Will Masters uh, and uh, we'll, the final speaker will be Suraba Mehta uh, from Cornell. And uh, the three speakers will have, I can't remember the allotted time, but please keep to your allotted times. Uh, I'll look it up while you're speaking and get nasty if you go over. And then we'll have uh, questions and answers and back and forths and end up the session. So uh, I believe we're gonna be starting out with Giacomo. Uh, please go ahead and uh, we're looking forward to your talks. Each of the speakers will then uh, introduce the following speaker. Yes, uh, thank you very much, Professor Deckelbon for the introduction. My name is uh, Giacomo Zanello and I'm very excited to have the opportunity to share uh, with you some of the work that we have done with the Nutrition Innovation Lab. And I'm also very thankful for the uh, organizer for inviting me. Uh, today, I would like to talk about a new method that we developed to capture physical activity in rural setting in low and middle income countries. This is gonna be a combination of using accelerometer devices and triangulating that information with survey instruments. Uh, before getting into a little bit the details of what uh, we have done, I would like to share with you how this idea actually born. And we can see in the next slide how a few uh, years ago, we were uh, looking around in the big cities in Europe and in other parts of the world. A lot of people doing uh, physical activities, running and uh, having tracking devices to check the physical activity, the energy expenditure that they were spending. Sorry, Giacomo, just one second. I don't, I don't see the slides on my screen. Am I, uh, uh, are they being shown? Uh, I believe so, but if not, uh, maybe they can let us know. Um, so uh, I, I will carry on. 
And uh, if there is something wrong, I'm sure someone will, uh, will let us know. Um, so having, uh, having uh, uh, watched all those people looking at uh, using these tracking devices, uh, we thought, uh, how can we use that information in a completely different setting? And we see in the next, uh, in the next slide uh, how we were thinking of uh, using the same technology in a very different environment in which the livelihood of the people are very much based on the physical activity, often very heavy, very strenuous physical activity in their everyday life. Uh, in the past, for the past four or five years, we were able to develop this new methodological approach. Uh, and we see in the last picture on the bottom right, uh, a lady from Ghana wearing a belt with an accelerometer devices. Accelerometer devices are devices that capture movement that can be then translated in physical activity. So with this idea, and we see in the next slide, uh, we put together a, a list of different partners, both in country and, uh, and in UK and the US, which we very much leverage. And we learn how effectively we could develop this new methodology. So what, uh, what did we do? In the next slide, we can see uh, in a snapshot uh, what uh, we develop. We develop uh, a methodology in which we combine energy expenditure capture from accelerometer devices with survey instrument that capture time use and activity. So what people do and food intake. So what people eat. And the combination of those three different uh, different stream of data is uh, what, uh, what we build in this new methodological approach, which initially we lay down in a, a field manual for practitioners. And we can see here on the right hand side, the document. And uh, we highlight, and I will try to highlight in this, uh, in this presentation, the kind of insight that such a methodology can provide, both in terms of program implementation or program evaluation and policy development, of insight in the rural livelihood that before we were not able to capture. In the next slide, I provided you a little bit the kind of data that we collected. We collect data from three different countries. And we followed a small number of households for uh, throughout an agricultural season. So in each household, both the head and the spouse took part to the study. And we followed them for uh, four non-consecutive weeks throughout an agricultural season. The idea was uh, while we were testing the methodology and how we can combine a workflow across those three different stream of data to provide some data that co could showcase the potential for such, uh, such methodology. The data we can see in the next slide uh, with a click has been publicly, is publicly available to everyone and everyone can, uh, can have access to it. In the next uh, three slides, and this is very much the core of my presentation, I would like to give you a snapshot of the kind of insight that we can get with this new stream of data. And I'm going to highlight how in the past, when we look at agriculture and nutritional health linkages, there has actually been a, forget, a forgiven link, sort of, and that is the energy expenditure. We often talk about uh, dietary intake. We often talk about uh, uh, how the contribution of uh, uh, agriculture and agricultural innovation can have, but often we do not take into account actually the physical activity that might derive through that uh, innovations or uh, the energy expenditure required uh, by uh, adopting certain innovation. The first, uh, the first 
sort of a case study that I would like to uh, show you is a work in which we look at uh, reduction, drudgery reduction. So basically we ask ourselves, what if a rural household, in this case in India, were to increase their light activity by one hour every day with a reduction of moderate or heavy activity proportional to that? This could be the case of uh, uh, an introduction of a new innovation, but could be also the case that we are observing in the long term in terms of rural uh, transformation in which uh, the livelihood in rural areas are changing. And we want to see how this change in the, uh, in the pattern of physical activity have an effect on the energy requirement. We can see in the next click how Actually, uh, in the next slide, we see how the effect varies uh, quite a bit between men and women. So a reduction uh, of a drudgy reduction of one hour uh, of uh, moderate and vigorous activities uh, reduced the energy requirement by between 17 to 24% for men and 14 to 17% for women. The interesting part uh, that we were able to explore is uh, how the differences, and I gave a range because changes quite a bit by not only sex, but also such social demographic characteristics of the household. For example, uh, household with a large land endowment have a larger reduction of energy requirement or household with an irrigation. And this is quite important because when we want to promote new agricultural technologies, the effect that they might have in terms of reduction of physical activity might well be different across different households. The second case study that I would like to show you is in the next slide. And is about the trade-off that men and women are doing in terms of pattern of time and the energy intensity. So we want to look at uh, how women and men spend their time and their energy uh, during, uh, uh, during the agricultural season and across a productive, reproductive and leisure time. What we observe is that the women shoulder most of the reproductive work. So domestic work, childcare work. And this is at the expenses of leisure opportunities. This is both in terms of energy expenditure, so the proportion of energy that they spend and the proportion of time that they spend throughout the agricultural season. Again, the implication of these are quite important when we think about all the innovation that we are adopting in terms of um, imposing certain gender specific demand on energy exhaustion and time. Uh, those could be agriculture innovation, but also other innovation that could be part of the rural livelihood. My last case study is about uh, looking at uh, intra-household allocation of uh, time and how this affect the energy adequacy of uh, the head and the spouse. In this work, what we are trying to do is uh, looking at uh, how, uh, the, how the men, the male, spend their time, how that affect their own energy adequacy, but also the partner's energy adequacy. So we are looking at intra-household allocation of time with energy, and we do that with this new dimension of the effect of activities into the energy expenditure. We have the food intake, we have the energy expenditure, so we are looking at the energy adequacy uh, within the household. What we find, and this is uh, in the next uh, slide, is uh, um, we find that uh, uh, a stronger correlation between uh, uh, the activities that both the male and the female within the household are doing. And those are negatively linked with the calorie intake adequacy. This is quite important when we think about all the uh, development effort and programs 
that try to minimize the trade-off that women need to do when they uh, when uh, um, when uh, um, all the, the women they need to do. And, uh, and, and the implication of this is that a greater uh, cooperation between spouses should be part of, uh, uh, and a better understanding how this can be done, can be part of uh, um, the implementation of those policies. And of course, those changes between uh, uh, social and cultural, uh, cultural uh, settings. Just to conclude, uh, I would like to, uh, to move from these three sort of a snapshot. Uh, I know the time was very, very short, but I hope to give you an idea how these new methodologies, this new stream of data and combination of data that were not available anymore could actually help uh, to develop new policies and programs. The first one is uh, a consideration about how accelerometer could actually provide the opportunities for new and better data, data that we were not able to collect before and now we can collect in a free living population. And that should be considered as a complement to the current approaches. And then this new stream of data of energy expenditure embedded with the data that we are already collecting like food intake or time use, could have facilitated a better understanding of those linkages between agricultural intervention and nutritional outcome. And this is for also for different members of the household. I provided a few examples on what we could see as a intended or unintended consequences of the uh, introduction of new technologies within the household. Uh, it got the potential to shed light within the intra-household dynamics and how the allocation of labor and energy expenditure can be different between males and females. Finally, it could provide an insight into the prevalence, the depth, and the severity of undernutrition because we would have a better understanding on the actual energy requirement that uh, individual and rural uh, environment needs. Those might be very different, not only by age and sex, but also by household characteristics, by endowment, by composition and cultural norms. So that kind of information can shed light into the better understanding of those dimension of undernutrition. With this, I would like to conclude and uh, um, and uh, I will pass the word to Professor Masters, which will talk about the importance of uh, a better understanding of food prices uh, for uh, uh, affordability and a healthy diet. So thank you very much everyone for your attention and looking forward for the question later. Thank you, Giacomo. Yeah, that's an amazing study, I think, um, and follows on really well, actually. I hope participants were able to uh, watch uh, the previous session on um, gut health and food safety and pathogens, you know, just hearing now from Giacomo about physical activity, what we'll look now at is food systems and food prices in the marketplace and how interventions guided by the Nutrition Innovation Lab's uh, findings uh, can help guide value chains, policies, and programs uh, to bring healthy foods within reach. So this will lead really well, I think, into Sara Meta's um, measurement within foods, but now we're looking at the food system as a whole. So the next slide shares our starting place. 10 years ago, what did we have when we began this work? Uh, my colleague, Jerry Shively, who presented yesterday uh, from Purdue University, was able to work with uh, George Omiot, um, PhD student who's now a lecturer at Makere University in Kampala in, in Uganda. And what they took was data up to that time. So through 2011, what you see along the horizontal axis is uh, the prices at each market location. Every line is a market location within the country of Uganda uh, in each month. And these are prices collected by uh, the National uh, Statistical Agency in order to inform the overall inflation and recalculating that using these novel metrics to think about is the food system making nutrients all uh, essential vitamins, uh, minerals, and uh, protein, carbohydrates, and fats in the proportions needed 
for lifelong health uh, available at an affordable price. So the horizontal uh, red dashed line is the $1.25 national poverty line. On the vertical axis is that equivalent in Ugandan shillings. And uh, the, you see the squiggly lines showing enormous variability uh, from month to month. You can start to see seasonal patterns if you squint. You can see big differences from year to year and you can see big spatial differences. What we see is that overall, almost all months, almost all locations, the cost of essential nutrients exceeds the poverty line. And this is the research agenda that we dug into uh, in the innovation lab and associated, just like Giacomo's project, associated with uh, research being done around the world on, on other funding. So as Richard uh, very kindly introduced the session uh, with the idea of the Nutrition Innovation Lab providing this hub, this sort of seed money, this linkage, this connectivity, so that we could take this research being done with, in, in the case of the data I'll show you now, uh, in the next slide, please, uh, that was largely funded by uh, UK Foreign Aid, now the FCDO, and also the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, in a project uh, called Food Prices for Nutrition, where we were able to take some Feed the Future uh, nutrition Innovation Lab uh, data and marry that with a wide range of other kinds of data to get the results uh, that I'll describe here. So the central point is that when we study how well food markets work for the poor, what we find in the top left there is that foods with healthy attributes are just too expensive for the poorest. They're too expensive for essentially everyone in a country like uh, Uganda, Malawi, and so forth. Um, but in uh, higher income countries, including places like Ghana, uh, let alone um, uh, the US, Europe, and so forth, um, these uh, least cost items that bring the nutrient, uh, nutrients and the food groups that we need are affordable, but often not chosen by richer people. So that's our research agenda. What you see is the discovery of this stair step. Uh, the stair step idea is uh, in some sense, the core finding of this line of work. It's that uh, daily energies at the bottom so a person might be climbing this stair step and that is the bare threshold of survival. So the climb starts there. Daily energy in measured in, of course, in calories are coming at least cost, the most affordable you can imagine are starchy staples. So it might be rice uh, in a irrigated system in Asia, it might be maize, uh, it might even be millet, sorghum, and of course, in some cases, cassava. Uh, in some uh, rare cases, uh, could be sweet potato. Um, and, and occasionally it might be a plantain, but typically it's a cereal grain. And vegetable oils and sugar are about the same cost per calorie, and you can imagine why that, that is. Turns out to be about 75 cents a day in real terms. So in terms of the total uh, value of other things, other goods and services in the economy, if you compare prices uh, matching items one-to-one, -one, it's about 75 cents uh, in US current US terms. So that's what it costs just to survive. People with incomes below that, are typically not surviving uh, without aid. If you want to get to nutrient adequacy, and that was the question that George Omiat and Gerald Chively answered in the slide before, um, that costs on average about $2 a day around the world. And their initial results for Uganda are borne up in our studies uh, of every other country in the world, where that's mostly because you have to add in uh, a a little bit of fruits and vegetables, a little bit of ASFs, uh, but mostly a lot more leguminous grains that are more expensive than the cereal grains. Uh, so the low cost beans, dal, um, cow peas, and so forth, uh, raise cost up to $2 uh, per day, plus a little bit of fruits and vegetables and a little bit of uh, typically dairy is the least cost uh, source of the essential uh, vitamins that would be coming from uh, animal source foods and not available typically to B vitamins. Um, from the fruits and vegetables. Then the overall cost of a healthy diet uh, is about $3.50 a day. That's the green threshold, the green stair step. And that's because uh, an overall healthy diet as defined in national dietary guidelines, such as the United States, um, my plate uh, and countries all around the world have drawn on the same data to uh, develop roughly similar uh, food group requirements for overall um, healthy diet throughout the life course. And that involves quite a bit more fruits and vegetables than are needed just for the essential nutrients. It also involves um, lower levels of carbohydrates than are needed for essential nutrients. So overall healthy diets uh, cost quite a bit more than just essential nutrients. And then of course, there's this 
uh, peach colored stair step above of all the other things that people want. So people are in high income countries, middle income countries spending a lot more than the least cost items uh, because they want those things. So much less drudgery as Giacomo was talking about, uh, much less need for cooking fuel and so forth in the home and meeting tastes and preferences given the overwhelming fire hose of advertising and marketing effort to sell uh, more convenient, more tasty and other uh, attributes of, of processed foods. So we've been investigating these least cost diets to understand cost and affordability of the nutrient attributes uh, in a series of studies that you see on the right, reaching the health uh, community through Lancet Global Health and that sort of a journal through food policy um, and the economics community through American Journal of Agricultural Economics and so forth. Um, you see the Science Advances paper that got at ecosystem function. Uh, in, in East Africa, I'll show you those data in a moment, and most importantly, reaching the FAO. So I'll share with you results in the next slide that the FAO published as part of the uh, State of Food Insecurity, used to be called SOFI. So the State of Food Security and Nutrition in the World, now published every year, uh, has standard measures of how well the food system is doing. Um, and what we find is that around the world in this work uh, published by the FAO is that while diet composition, the exact foods chosen in different countries uh, to meet human health requirements vary greatly. So in some cases it could be chapati and dal, other cases rice and beans, other cases uh, matoke or uh, any other type of local, local food, but the costs are fairly similar around the world. So if you advance with the next uh, animation, what you see is that in each location, the if you advance with the next animation, we'll see just not mouse click, we'll see that each place has roughly similar uh, prices that have to be paid by rich and poor people. So rich people might shop in a slightly fancier, uh, rest, uh, fancier marketplace, but um, if you look for the least cost items, uh, the poorest people have to compete against richer people. This is familiar to us from every market we've ever been to. Richer people and poor people are shopping for the same item and have to say, pay a similar price. So look at the Blue at the very bottom is the cost of survival. Remember that's about 75 cents a day. The red is the cost of nutrient adequacy, about $2 a day. And then the cost of meeting a my plate or other recommended diet, roughly 350 a day. What you see is the error bars, uh, the interquartile range and the, and the uh, full range of variation around that associated with seasons, different countries, different places. Um, but the only really almost statistically, not quite statistically significant difference with the next advance the next animation, please, is that there's a slightly smaller step up to meet dietary guidelines in the highest income countries because only the highest income countries of the world have sufficiently uh, universal refrigeration, sufficiently rapid transport for dairy to be a low cost item. So in uh, low and middle income countries, dairy, which is a crucial least cost uh, source of um, B vitamins and other nutrients is uh, much more expensive than it is in uh, highest income countries. The next slide. When we look at uh, affordability of those uh, food groups and nutrients, since their co the cost of the food is pretty similar around the world uh, and similar for rich and poor people within each country, uh, the main driver of affordability is income. Income varies by a factor of uh, 20, 50, 100, whereas uh, food prices vary by a factor of two. And so it's really income distribution within countries and between countries that drives lack of affordability. And this is, uh, once you look at it this way, a very intuitive idea, um, but was not known before this kind of measurement uh, was done. And so you see for a, uh, daily energy, uh, roughly 185 million people in 2017, which is when these data were, uh, the data for which these uh, results were calculated in the FAO SOFI report, um, and those are in primarily in Central Africa, uh, where extremely low incomes because of uh, extremely unequal income distribution from a, from a low level. Then nutrient adequate diets, uh, African countries again, and also South Asia. And then the last map at the bottom shows uh, countries shaded in terms of the fraction of people who cannot afford an overall healthy diet and the number of people in the different regions. Uh, and, and what you see is that this really comes down to a matter of, of income variation because the costs of the items, while they vary significantly by season, by region within a country, as we've seen before, uh, have this very similar pattern across countries. So if you advance one more, we'll see the comparison between this kind of result and other ways of thinking about how well 
uh, global food systems and the, and the world uh, is able to meet human needs. Uh, there's, of course, the World Bank poverty line. I showed you the Uganda specific poverty line of $1.25. The World Bank's uh, universal poverty line for all countries in the world is $1.90. And that shows about 690 million people in 2017 were below that line. Of course, many more now because of COVID. Uh, so what we're finding with the cost of a uh, healthy diet is, is a much higher uh, uh, barrier, if you will, than that poverty line. Undernourishment is the standard measure from the, FA, uh, uh, from the uh, FAO. Their prevalence of undernourishment measure uh, estimating total number of people who cannot have adequate calories, they're estimating 630 million. That metric, that way of calculating dates from the 1960s, uh, they continue to update it every year because it's consistent in its measurement. Uh, but it's a very, very old idea. Um, and then there's the newer idea of food insecurity, the food insecurity experience scale, FIES, uh, gives 1.9 billion. So what you see is this new number of 3 billion is one more step up towards meeting human needs as defined by dietary guidelines. So the next advance gives us the um, way in which, just an insight into the way in which the FAO is producing annual updates for this. And we're also working within countries and the innovation lab, uh, you know, as, as the innovation labs evolve, uh, what you'll see from USAID is I think a very important engagement uh, in this process. And the next slide gives us um, a little bit of the flavor of the kind of research results we get when we look within countries. You see in the middle, the sine waves are showing the pattern of seasonality. Uh, if you could see the Y axes, you would see they're quite different. Uh, Ethiopia is not only out of sync with a different timing, uh, but it has a smaller rise and fall. The Y axis is much smaller. Ethiopia actually has two seasons. Um, so the light rains is not quite enough to offset the main season. On the left, what you see is the energy shares of each food group with the starchy staples dominating, especially in Malawi, because Malawi has much more expensive other food groups. Um, and then on the right, you see the seasonal fluctuations of each food group uh, in the data that we have. And the next slide takes us to uh, the question that I think everyone is, uh, if they're not currently sort of thinking about in their own country, certainly most important uh, globally, is the question of how is COVID playing out in food markets around the world? Uh, as you know, there were great disruptions at the start of any COVID, any country's COVID pandemic, whenever that timing might be, uh, because people suddenly cannot uh, uh, move around um, and the lockdowns, self-imposed or government lockdowns will uh, severely disrupt uh, the, the, the food system. And what we see here is with the next slide, next advance, um, that the average rise in the real cost of food, that is the real consumer price index of food relative to other things, is about 3%. This is unrelated, different, not at all the same as agricultural commodities. So this is about the retail market price tracking over literally tens of thousands of items in uh, countries all around the world. Um, what we see is on average, something like a 3% rise in the retail prices of food relative to all other things. Really remarkable um, magnitude uh, given the variety of foods all around the world, Northern hemisphere, Southern hemisphere and so forth happening uh, when the pandemic began uh, in February, 20, after the pandemic began uh, and the vertical line shows the start of that in February, 2020. And the next slide shows how this is, we're beginning to link this to uh, the magnitude of the pandemic and a lot of new work on this now with the next slide showing the, the basic result there that it's a, it's a somewhat larger rise in the countries that have more case counts. Um, and we're continuing to work on this question in, um, uh, with, with uh, a wider range of new kinds of data. The next slide gives us um, another dimension of new work which is really crucial for the food systems agenda ahead. So this is with the UN Food Systems Summit, the scientific group trying to um, look within the household at non-market costs of meal preparation. So beyond just the cost of acquiring the foods from your own production, a home garden, or from the local market, uh, or brought into the local market, the previous work was all about the prices of the items that the household would obtain. Now we're looking within the household thinking about comparing the cost of uh, dry beans, which would meet nutrient adequacy at very low cost, but require cooking fuel with the cost of tinned beans. So tinned beans, of course, 19th century discovery, 
made in the 20th century on a massive scale uh, in, from the 1920s, 30s, 40s, uh, overwhelmingly sort of taken for granted in rich countries are a very expensive, very important, remarkably valuable in nutritional and health terms uh, kind of innovation uh, in, in low income countries. And what you see here is, is just beginning to think about just the magnitude of the cooking fuel costs, which are shown in uh, below the uh, cost of the, of, the, of the beans. And we're just beginning to look at these costs of meal preparation uh, to see how they affect the, um, the, 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 the analysis of whether the food system is in fact bringing nutritious diets within reach. And so the concluding slide gives us a sense of the, the results. So as you've seen for many, many people, roughly 3 billion people, about 40% of the world's population, healthy diets as defined by dietary guidelines are simply beyond reach. Nothing they can do, no, no, uh, no, no choice, no knowledge, no behavior can bring, they are just out of reach because the food system has not brought costs down or incomes up. And the reason is that perishable or bulky foods are simply more costly to grow and distribute. There's not some magic wand you can uh, wave to bring them their costs down below. Some of the lowest cost, most efficient countries have given you the flavor of some of the innovations that can bring those costs down by 20, 30, 40, even 50%, but that still leaves costs out of reach uh, for the poorest. And in this, uh, with this calculation, about 3 billion people. And the next uh, bullet shows you the implication of that, that the central agenda of agricultural transformation that underlies the global food security strategy of USAID and so many others is really the central story here. To bring people out of poverty through higher agricultural productivity, farming as a business to make money and be able to buy the foods that people need, that is the main headline story. That is the uplift that has risen people above the threshold of being able to even afford a healthy diet uh, if they uh, want to. Of course, there is also an agenda within agriculture, and that is the, the central focus of interventions that target uh, healthier foods, both the initial production to bring production costs down, but in our work, really crucially, the farm to market uh, value chain. And the next bullet asks, so for everyone else, what's going on? That's most people, 4.9 billion people. Um, healthy items are available. I can assure you within a few uh, minutes of wherever you are now, you could go out and buy uh, foods that would be a healthy diet. So why are people consuming that more, more widely? The next bullets you know, give us some sense of what's going on. Uh, price is not the issue, something else is the issue. So we are investigating the meal preparation question, which is absolutely central. So Giacomo's work on the drudgery factor, really central here. I talked about cooking fuel costs, but the cooking time cost, highly gendered, very age specific, an enormous burden, uh, particularly on young women uh, and therefore affecting uh, their children uh, because of the uh, drudgery and, and time cost of meal preparation. But there's a major role for food preferences, culture, taste satiation, uh, and the fire hose of marketing of the competing firm uh, foods, the competing foods that uh, compete for stomach share, mind share, budget share, uh, with uh, uh, fire hose of advertising, marketing to bring those within reach available on every street corner, um, and, uh, and with the most compelling formulations and, uh, and marketing messages. So we're trying to understand this food system as a whole. And the next bullets uh, give us the, the big challenging question of overcoming the, 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 the COVID changes that have uh, enormously altered both the cost of food and, and people's incomes. And the next bullet wraps up with this um, idea that there's an enormous food systems for nutrition agenda ahead. So that's drive, driven by the discovery of how to measure these things. And Saurabh uh, will, in the next presentation, talk about measuring within food items. Um, and we're able to then aggregate up those metrics up to uh, spatial resolution to look at variation in space, Temporal resolution, a lot of focus on longitudinal work to look at change over time. And I haven't mentioned, but we do have quite a bit of work on demographic variation by age, by sex, pregnancy, lactation. Um, we touched on a little bit of that in the conversation yesterday. 
uh, but there's an enormous agenda on targeting by type of uh, demographic needs. So thank you so much for the opportunity to do this work with the Innovation Lab uh, partners. Um, I really have been astounded by the, the range, the depth, the excitement of this, that this agenda has brought forward in terms of people working together. And Saurabh is a great example of that. So Saurabh. Um, thank you, thank you, Will. Thank you for the fascinating talk and thank you for the lead in. Um, thank you also for the opportunity to sh both share our work as well as support it. And um, also one th a shout out to Devin and the production crew, particularly for uh, dealing with uh, my eccentricities around font and format and whatnot. Uh, so with that, I will just uh, give a brief overview on uh, uh, what we have been doing on in terms of measurement of nutrition and food safety biomarkers at the point of care or at the point of need. Um, uh, next slide, please. Uh, I'll start with the disclosure slide. Uh, all our research funding uh, support sources are listed on uh, for the last 12 months are listed on the slide. The work that we are going to cover, work that I'm going to cover today is largely funded by National Institutes of Health, National Science Foundation, and the Global Alliance for Improved Nutrition, and also supported by USAID through the Nutrition Innovation Lab. Uh, I'm uh, of note, I'm a co-founder as well as on the board of directors of a startup company called Vitascan, which is commercializing some of the technology that we have developed around measuring nutritional uh, tests or nutritional status at the point of care from a drop of blood. And next slide, please. Um, so this is a, just a brief outline of what we have been working on, uh, just an overview where we started, what the problem is, what we have done, and uh, what we are doing as part of the Nutrition Innovation Lab. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, this is a general overview of our work. Uh, a lot of this work is guided by this mission that uh, how do we leverage advances in technology to bridge health disparities and um, increase increase healthcare utilization, healthcare access, and so on. Uh, for example, if you think about inventing a CD scan or an MRI, it typically, it's a great advancement in medicine, but then it basically typically uh, will increase health disparity in a way that the people who are rich or have resources will be able to afford better care, but people who are poor won't, won't be able to. So our mission was how do we leverage advances in modern technology to bridge that and how do we bring some of these technologies to the point of care or into the community itself. So our work has, the work that I'm gonna focus on is gonna largely talk about precision nutrition and how we are expanding that into food. Next slide, please. Sorry, I keep pushing the next button on my keyboard. Uh, so uh, the problem statement that we started with was that access to affordable and reliable micronutrient status testing remains sparse, both at the population level uh, when we think about population surveys, then also at the personalized level, if you're thinking about individual level or precision health kind of metrics. And then of course, for food that, uh, whether it's at the point of production, at storage or point of consumption, uh, figuring out micronutrient status testing either is very expensive or is inaccessible. And uh, so that creates all kinds of challenges for both targeting uh, interventions as well as monitoring response and impact evaluation. And so we started with can point of care devices help? Next slide, please. Our vision really was that uh, we had to set some parameters around when we uh, started working on this about 10 years ago. We of course wanted high sensitivity and high specificity. So, and then we wanted to figure out whether we'd be able to get to a screening kind of a cut point or a diagnostic cut point. Will we be able to call a device screening device or a diagnostic device? We all wanted minimal sample. We wanted minimal infrastructure needs, minimal training, minimal cost. And the vision really was either extend the reach of traditional laboratories or be a laboratory uh, unto itself in resource limited settings. Next slide, please. Uh, so what we've invented is uh, we call it fondly NutriPhone. You'll see that theme repeat itself because we are not very creative with our names. Uh, so it will be NutriPhone, Fever Phone, Safe Phone, uh, name it. We have a phone kind of a thing with it. Uh, because partly what we were trying to do was we were using the smartphone's capabilities to bypass traditional laboratory instrumentation. And that's why that phone kind of theme repeats itself. And uh, what we have done in the last 10 years, we have, uh, uh, we have about 20 plus publications, peer review journal publications in this area. We have about uh, three issued patents, three, three pending patents in this area um, and applying the technology to nutrition, to uh, 
infectious diseases to antibiotic resistance lately. So across the board, um, we are trying to work with these advances in nanofluidics and uh, nanotechnology. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, the way this works is, in this case, it's a heel prick because there's a baby shown here, but you take a uh, small amount of blood, either from a finger prick or heel prick, uh, capillary blood, of course, you drop it on a test strip. The test strip has all the reagents that are needed to do the test. Uh, our initial versions of, of this reader started with something that went on a smartphone itself, but uh, we ended up putting it, putting everything together in a portable reader, which um, I will go into the details of later. And then the test result is displayed on the mobile app and then can go to an electronic health record database, can go into any other systems and um, or centralized government surveillance systems. So it's a complete kind of a lab on a, or a, a healthcare platform hub where all the data collection can happen on the phone or a smart device, the laboratory testing can happen, and then triage and referral and uh, other updates can happen as well. Next slide, please. Um, it's, there is a step-by-step -step guidance to the user um, through uh, guiding them through all the steps on the using a mobile app. Uh, next slide, please. This is the current generation of the reader. That's what it looks like. This is all that you need for doing this test. So there's a smartphone that will guide you through step by step. And then there are test strips. And then there is a small reader, um, uh, which basically will read the test strip. So the test strip goes at the bottom of the reader. It, tests, it reads the result and uh, you have an answer. Uh, this is showing the application to uh, AFB, which we, uh, we are getting into trying to build a portable device for quad screening for pregnant women. And that's, uh, uh, we just published a paper on it. AFB screening using this format. All right, next slide, please. Uh, we have, of course, the number one question that people ask is that can we do more than one? We have uh, done that multiple times now. So this is one of the first paper where we multiplexed uh, different, different analytes or different targets, which are RN, vitamin A, and uh, C-reactive protein. Uh, this was published in PNS in uh, December 2017. Since then, we have done this for multiple other analytes with different approaches. So the mul simplest multiplexing is to put multiple test strips together, but other ways of multiplexing is to put multiple target analytes on a single test strip, or even on the same test line, put multiple different analytes and have them different colors. So we have done that for malaria, for example, where we have a malaria uh, target, and then we have a falciparum target biomarker, and we have combined, we have used red and blue for both. And if you get red, you the result means one thing, blue means another thing, purple means that something else. So it's, we have used the color combinations to get to the multiplexing part as well. Uh, next slide, please. So this is where we are. This is all the, these are all the things that we have already published on. Uh, there are a lot of other things on the pipeline. Uh, we just published on actually on uh, tuberculosis a couple of weeks ago and uh, also on typhoid last week. So that's, these are the things that are in pipeline. We are now working on a uh, uh, sepsis panel that's about to come, that paper is about to come out, I think in a couple of weeks. So, uh, but for uh, most important, uh, most relevant here is the food safety work that we are doing, uh, which is trying to measure aflatoxin and femonisin in uh, food, as well as blood, urine, and milk, because all the other biomarkers we have so far focused largely on blood. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, this is uh, this is a concept that we had for expanding the matrix uh, beyond blood. This is a concept for saliva that uh, got us a hundred thousand dollar prize last year, a technology accelerator challenge prize from NIH for uh, global health diagnostics. And this is kind of the uh, this is the this is one of the things that we are doing in the future, and this will be relevant for also for aflatoxin because some of the technologies that we are developing here will be relevant to that. Uh, next slide, please. So that brings me to the safe phone. Uh, the concept for this originated from a uh, in a conversation with uh, people at Global Alliance for Improved Nutrition that can we expand our technology to look at aflatoxin uh, biomarkers. And we initially started with biomarkers in blood, but really uh, what took off was the work in food. And that, that is about to go out in our publication. And I'll talk about it again. As I said, the phone thing keeps repeating. And uh, here we were able to make a nice 
acronym out of it. So smartphone-based aflatoxin evaluation at the point of need. Um, and it's also future-proof because I can break that aflato ANF to aflatoxin and femonicin. So, which is what's coming. Uh, the primary work here was done by my uh, research associate Balaji Srinivasan and also by two former graduates, uh, one former graduate student and one former postdoc, Zengda Lu and Amit Barui. Uh, next slide, please. The difference in the reader for the safe phone is uh, that it's a European based reader. So for those of you into the technical side of things, our typical work has been based, uh, has been based on gold nanoparticles and the gold nanoparticles emit a certain surface resonance that we can capture with uh, optically with the camera. In this case, because the aflatoxin levels are so low, the concentrations are in the picogram per ml range uh, that we needed something more sensitive than gold. And in that case, it's uh, a, the answer for that is a European nanoparticle. So we measure the fluorescence from the European nanoparticle using this kind of a setup. Next slide, please. Uh, there are different biomarkers, obviously. For food, we are looking at aflatoxin B1. For urine, we are looking at aflatoxin M1. And for blood, we are looking in largely at aflatoxin B1 lysine adults. Next slide, please. And then these are the details of the different antibodies and the different uh, things that we have used to set it up, both for food and for urine. Uh, next slide, please. And uh, for food, basically, we were targeting the USDA cutoff for AFB1 in food, which is 20 nanograms per ml. Our current assay now covers about 5 to 40 nanograms per ml. And so our limit of detection is as low as 5 nanograms per ml. Next slide, please. And uh, this is just the brief validation of results that was done in partnership with the Office of the Texas State Chemist and the Texas A&M University. And, um, um, and then we recently just got funding from NSF to also expand this work to Fumonison with the Texas State Chemist Office, and uh, that's ongoing. Next slide, please. Blood, on the other hand, is a different story <laughs> because AFB1, because it's a complex addict at a very low concentration, uh, there is also not a lot of work that has gone into measuring AFP1 in blood. So unlike things like ferritin, we also don't really know that whether capillary and venous blood concentrations correlate very well in AFP1. Whereas like if for other biomarkers, that a lot of that work has been done for the last 30, 40 years. So there are lack of commercial sources for antibodies. There is no reference antigen standard. There are not many commercial labs doing it any kind of gold standard testing. So all the processes around uh, that we use for lateral flow immunoassay manufacture, all of them are limited. So we, we really had to start from square one. Uh, next slide, please. And what we are doing really is we have just finished a sub-study and we just got results this week back to compare capillary versus venous blood samples uh, for AFB1 concentrations. And we are doing that in partnership with labs at University of Georgia and at Johns Hopkins. And once we have that data, then we'll be able to decide whether we want to um, make a test for capillary aflatoxin levels or venous aflatoxin levels. And, um, and then we'll, we also have access, thankfully, to uh, the samples that were collected by the Tufts team in Nepal and Uganda that we'll eventually be able to do validation efforts with. Um, next slide, please. So where is, what, what is all this work going to lead to and where are we? Uh, the main issue is the last mile. So we are able to do for a lot of, a lot of these tests, if you're familiar with the WH as a short criteria, we're able to do steps one to six. The step seven, which is delivered to those who need it. So do we have a sustainable business model to produce it? That's where the challenge is. So I will end, I will conclude by just uh, sharing where we are with our different uh, with our product portfolio. Next slide, please. And uh, it's repeating the same thing that we can, in academic settings, we can do so much and then how do we uh, make it ready for industry uptake? And uh, next slide, please. Yeah, so this is our asset development pipeline. So you can see ferritin is the one which has gotten to the regulatory stage where the FDA is reviewing uh, or the process for FDA review of the test has started. And because all of the blood tests, we have to get those reviewed through the FDA. Everything else is basically at either the publication or the proof of concept stage. Uh, next slide, please. I think that just zooms in into the Nutrifone and the Fiofone part. Uh, next slide, please. Next slide. Thank you. Uh, next slide, please. 
So I'll just stop there and say thank you. I have an amazing diverse team. And this is, a, a, of course, our team photo is about two years old now. Uh, we have not been able to get together. So I have had to add people on the other side. And um, um, and so none of this is possible without these guys. Um, next slide, please. And of course, all the funders. I'll stop there. Thank you. Well, th that was uh, quite a session. Uh, and again, speaking from Iceland, uh, I think we've just seen perhaps the tip of the iceberg here in, in terms of examples of uh, new methods, new approaches, new forms of analyses. And uh, I'd like to thank all the speakers. Uh, here on uh, Google Docs, I have some uh, specific questions that have been sent in. We'll start with uh, G Giacomo. Uh, and the uh, questioner is asking, were you able to look at the effects of body composition on variability in energy expenditure in men as compared to women? Yeah, that's, that's a very good question. Uh, uh, actually, body composition, it's something very important when we talk about energy requirement because uh, energy requirement, uh, uh, we, can, uh, uh, we can divide energy requirement uh, with uh, basal metabolic rate and uh, uh, um, energy, uh, total energy expenditure. So what it means, basal metabolic rate is the energy that uh, a human being requires to keep the body alive. So if you lay down in a bed throughout the day, your body needs uh, energy, your brain, your organs and everything just, just to function and survive. And the basal metabolic rate is uh, directly uh, correlated with the uh, body composition. So a basal metabolic rate of a small person will be smaller than a basal metabolic rate for a larger person. So effectively, the uh, body composition is already embedded in our research to the extent that different body composition will require different uh, energy. What, uh, um, what also uh, Will Master was mentioning about the energy that you require to survive and to do the activities that you need to do. That depends also from your, uh, from your body composition. And uh, that's something that we embed in our research as well. Thank you. And, um, it was also asked uh, if, if uh, interesting to address whether there were differences in findings from Ghana, uh, given the different social, ecological and physical environments uh, compared to uh, uh, Nepal and India? Yeah, we, we do find uh, uh, several differences across countries. Uh, something that we are very, uh, that I wanted to stress, and uh, maybe I didn't have the chance to do it in my presentation, is that uh, what we do uh, is what we call a small case studies. The reason is that uh, the methodology that we have developed uh, is suitable for a small sample because it tends to be quite uh, demanding in terms of resources and time. So effectively what we are trying to describe is uh, how the livelihood changes in those different uh, communities that we have, uh, we have uh, uh, visited and we were lucky to engage with, uh, uh, with the people there. So the differences that we find, uh, uh, we are very clear to mention that there are differences across the communities that we have visited. Uh, I would like to warn to say there are differences at larger level than what we could find in the communities. But uh, yes, we do find differences in terms of patterns of uh, uh, time use, how much time they spend uh, in uh, uh, economic activities versus domestic activities. Something, for example, that was quite interesting is also the engagement of men in domestic activities. For example, we see a minimal activities, uh, uh, minimal involvement of uh, um, men in domestic activity in Ghana, whether in Nepal, 
men tend to be engaged more in domestic activities. And when we look a little bit more what those domestic activities are, they tend to be those uh, activities that are quite uh, um, energy demanding. They could be fixing part of the house, uh, they could be fixing the roof. So we find those differences uh, and, uh, and, uh, and others also between uh, India and Nepal in terms of uh, engagement of women with leisure activities compared to domestic and economic activities as well. Mm, thank you. And uh, perhaps uh, I'll go a bit out of order uh, and ask uh, Sorba uh, a question, and then we'll go on to a question for, or two for Will. Uh, in in terms, this was you know remarkable how we're moving ahead with these uh, new methods of analyses. In terms of cost, are they going to be? Are these approaches going to be affordable uh, in research settings and in clinic settings? Are we going to be able to use these sort of as a routine analyses, uh, such as a hemoglobin strip or something else? Uh, uh, in the future, how do you, how do you envision that? Because uh, you there's been a big investment here, and uh, I think the results are proving to be terrific. But are we going to be able to afford it? Uh, thank you so much, uh, Richard. And uh, I think that's that's the key thing, and that's part of what I was alluding to in the last mile. Uh, so I cannot speak to what the price will be, uh, but the cost is basically it's there is no instrument required, right? So there is no major instrument. The reader really is like a Raspberry Pi chip, an imaging sensor, and a module to connect via Bluetooth or Wi-Fi. That's basically all that's in the reader. And so that's, if you buy that off the shelf, that's less than $100 for the reader. The cost of goods in a test strip is about a dollar. So for any, any of these uh, test strips, so that's the cost of goods. And now what the price is going to be, that's a different story. But from our perspective, like having no need for infrastructure, no need for cold chain, no need for any sophisticated labs uh, and everything being self-contained, very limited biohazard issues. So those, all of those things basically point to if, and, the, and if somebody, if a small scale producer came to us saying uh, Uganda, and they said they wanted to manufacture this, the setup cost for them is very low. For them to basically start with this manufacturing of this, um, the equipment that is needed, including the, you know, what you need is basically a paper cutter, a sophisticated paper cutter for making the test strips. Uh, and you can buy the plastic casing very easily from alibaba.com for <laughs> pennies. And, uh, and then you, all you need is basically then the calibrated reader, which is again, not very expensive. So that reader, of course, works across multiple tests. And... Uh, um, so again, the startup cost is not very high. The cost of goods is not very high. Now, whether the thing that for blood stuff, of course, the holdup is the FDA and the regulatory process all, always takes a much, lot longer. So once we have passed that process, I think we will see that this might start taking off a fair, well, I hope that this will at least start taking off in the research and the limited resource context. Good answer and exciting. Thank you. Thank you. And, uh, Will, the question came in here. I'm going to add another one. Uh, uh, you made a mention of the processed and convenience food. Uh, is there any way within the context of these analyses to assess access to ultra processed foods? And uh, are they going to have a role here? And uh, I guess, uh, how optimistic are you? I'm going to, for that 3 billion. 40% that are sort of out of reach of being able to achieve the, you know, what we really want them to achieve. How optimistic are you that this is going to happen and how long is it going to take to happen? Uh, yeah, so there's, there's a lot in those two, essentially two different questions. Um, let me start with the competing foods. Uh, so we used to use the term competing foods only for foods on the playground foods around schools, vending machines in schools as competing for the healthier diet that school children would get. So the idea was that we have legislation in the United States that keeps and elsewhere that keeps competing foods away from the playground, you know, away from school vending machines. 
Um, but we're now thinking of competing foods um, in the food system as a whole, and that these are displacing the healthier foods um, for uh, adults, for um, chronic disease, just as they do for children. And of course, often very habit forming. Um, and so the school competing foods relates to the. And so the basic agenda here um, is one which actually the Nutrition Innovation Lab pioneered in uh, Nepal and elsewhere with work that I think has not made it to this legacy event agenda, but you will have seen publications and a seminar from the Innovation Lab on the measurement of um, highly processed and ultra processed foods. What we're doing beyond that as next steps is to quantify what exactly about those foods is the harmful part, because our work has shown that healthy, helpful processing is one of the most important helpful things. First of all, for food safety. Secondly, for preservation and availability of essential nutrients. And third, for overall food group uh, healthy diet balance. So healthy, helpful processing needs to be distinguished from unhealthy, um, harmful processing. And we're beginning to be able to do that. The Innovation Lab has done some excellent work on just the degree to which these are very widely consumed actually, even in very low income rural settings. So first half of the question was about the competing foods, trying to measure them, understand them, and then regulate them as we do many other kinds of uh, harmful things in, 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 um, in the environment. So then for the second question about optimism, um, as uh, I hope everyone is aware, uh, stunting rates around the world have plummeted. So the efforts at maternal and child health that USAID and others have done have paid off handsomely in each successive generation being taller uh, and greater life expectancy around the world. In all countries of the world, except the United States, where our life expectancy has been falling because of our own neglect of our own public health. But our investments in others have paid off. We have seen each successive generation of children be taller with greater life expectancy around the world. Again, everywhere except the United States, that is a great triumph. I believe that can continue. Um, if we continue to make the investments that we've made, we can see the rest of the gap in child heights and longevity be closed. And I hope and believe that we can turn some of that energy and success back to the United States, where we are suffering a public health crisis from worsening life expectancy. Um, and we bring in to bring lessons such as Saurabh's uh, testing devices that are things that we can use in both under, and, and this is an important legacy for the Innovation Lab. And let me just close this long rant, if I can, just by bringing us back to the dual mission of, in pa Patrick's uh, opening statement about the origins of the Innovation Labs in what were called CRISPs, the Collaborative Research Support Programs. Those were the longest funded, continuously funded instrument of USAID history because they had a dual mandate to do research in Africa and Asia, Latin America that would bring home benefits to the US. And I worked at Purdue University where it was evident that the work done around the world mattered for Indiana farmers. And we can do this in the food system now. Uh, so in the food system, thinking about food manufacturing, food processing that can be helpful and healthy, um, that can uh, make food convenient, delicious, and above all, uh, nutritious and healthy, while not introducing the harmful things, like the things we're learning about Nepal, about Africa, through the Innovation Lab and, and its partners, we can bring those uh, to the US as a whole. So I'm very optimistic about um, the ability to do this. The question is the willingness. Okay, well, <clears throat> thanks. And I think we're, we're about one minute over our uh, scheduled ending of the session. Uh, are we allowed to continue for a 30 second last message from each of the speakers? Devin? If uh, we are, okay, thanks, Shaban. And uh, okay, so uh, why don't we take sort of a last message you'd like to leave on sort of the uh, new analyses, new methods that we brought into the session and uh, how they're going to help uh, what Will said really happen. Start with Giacomo. Uh, yes, thank you. Um, I, I would like to conclude just uh, uh, reiterating uh, the role that the National uh, the Nutrition uh, Innovation Lab uh, has had for the past few years uh, to really rediscover a forgotten link in, the, in agriculture and agriculture and nutrition and health. 
And that is the energy expenditure. I provided a little bit a kind of insight of uh, actually that piece of information in certain setting can really help us to better understand what uh, those linkages are. And uh, on the, I'm gonna conclude with a kind of looking forward. Uh, each of us got a mobile phone in our pockets and actually there are accelerometer in every mobile phone. So we could scale up this energy expenditure data to a large, large extent and gather many, much, much more data from a much more diverse population. So in the future with technology advancement, there will be a lot of opportunities, really not just to bring back this link, uh, this new data stream of energy, but also embed that in the research that we are already doing. And, uh, and then the Nutrition Innovation Lab has had a a key role really in uh, bringing together partners and uh, uh, activities that uh, has allowed that. Thanks. Will. Yeah, I would just underscore how much thinking has changed. So how far we've come in the last decade where when we began, we were really thinking about agriculture, nutrition interactions as what the household itself could do. And taking this food systems lens has really been transformative. So thinking about the levers that can affect uh, hundreds of millions, billions of people at once, and then go zoom in to the micro targeting and the efficacy that you can measure at the, at the household or even molecular level um, is really an amazing change of perspective. And thank you, Sora. Uh, thank you. And uh, I, I will just echo what others have said. I think uh, uh, with, the advances in both metrics and methods uh, around agriculture, nutrition, and health. I think these kind of multi-sectoral efforts, especially what N uh, Nutrition Innovation Lab has done, the multi-sectoral efforts are really needed because they're all complementary. And how do we focus, uh, at least in epi speak, I like to say, how do we go more left? How do we prevent more and more rather than trying to be closer to the curative side of things? So how do we, how do we use some of these approaches to prevent um, more um, hunger and suffering in a way? And so I would like to thank all the participants. And uh, I'm going to put in one little plug before we close the session. The thing is, we go forward because I think we are going to go forward with the Innovation Lab. It's really been uh, terrific. But I look forward to bringing in genomics and epigenetics to the uh, other sectoral uh, disciplines that we can be thinking about. So again, thank you very much. Uh, again, it was a privilege to be here with you and enjoy the rest of the sessions. Thank you. Thanks, everyone.